Hi everyone, in this video tutorial, we're going to look at volcanoes and other igneous activity. When we talk about igneous, we talk about the volcanic rocks and features that are formed inside and outside of the volcano. So stay tuned. The nature of volcanic eruptions, and this is something we've been talking about in the past two video tutorials, and we said that volcanoes erupt lava, right? So the characteristics of a magma determine the, determine the violence or explosiveness of a volcanic eruption. So remember in our previous lesson when we said that the thicker or the more viscous, the viscosity of the magma that comes out of the volcano as lava, the type of lava will determine the explosiveness. The more sticky lava will be more explosive and the more runny one will be less explosive. So this is what we're going to talk about. So the characteristics of a magma determine the violence or explosiveness of volcanic eruption. So it determines by the composition, the temperature at which the pressure is building up and the dissolved gases. The above three factor factors actually control the viscosity of a given magma. Okay, so is it high in silica? Is it low in water? Is it high in both? Is it runny? Is it thick? Is it under higher temperatures than before? The, the higher the temperature, the more runny the lava will be because that means the gases and materials will be dissolved more and become more liquidy than explosive material. Viscosity is a measure of a material's resistance to flow. So for example, if you take glue and you pour it on the side of something, like let's say the side of a, a a short cup or something, it will, it will stick while it flew. This means it is viscous. However, if I pour water, it will just run, right? So one is high in viscosity, one is low in viscosity. Viscosity in essence means sticky, right? So when we think about viscosity of lava, think about stickiness. Always remember sticky. Something that is sticky is viscous. Something that is not is runny. Now, viscous in the American sense is spelled with V I S C O S, and viscous in the British sense is spelled V I S C O U S. So, either one spelling is right. So, factors affecting viscous viscosity the temperature. So, we look at the first factor here temperature. Hotter magma are less viscous, meaning they are more melted. Think about it. If I have, for example, a chocolate and I just have it at room temperature and it melts, it will be not that runny, but it will be kind of sticky. However, if I apply some heat to it, it will become liquidy, right? The next factor affecting viscosity is composition. Silica, and this is the chemical version of silica, SiO2, which is Si is silica in the periodic table and O2 is oxygen. The silica content. Higher silica content means higher viscosity. If you think about silicone or silica, you think about something bluey, right? Example, felsic lava such as rhyolite. So this is just an example of lava. Low silica content means lower viscosity. So the, it is like watery lava, meaning it's runny. Example, mafic lava such as basalt. And the basalt lava come through cracks in the earth's surface and just flows to the side. And they form layers eventually. And the cell high silica composition lava will be explosive and pyroclastic. So it will kind of stick up to the side and become very violent in terms of a, a volcano. Dissolved gases now determines the viscosity. Gas content affect magma mobility. Gas expand within a magma as it nears the Earth's surface due to decreasing pressure. So when the magma is below the Earth's surface, it is very high pressured. And as it reaches towards the surface of the Earth, it loses that pressure. So if this is our volcano, I'm just catching something really fast. And this is the vent. And this is the Earth's crust. And this is below the earth, right? This is where the magma chamber might be. Magma chamber. This is high pressure in the system. And as it go up, the volcano pressure releases, right? 
Think about it. Think about you holding your breath and your faces and cheeks are well rosy. And then time to release the air, you get the release of pressure. The violence of an eruption is related to how easily gases escape from magma. So if gases do not escape, it becomes violent. If gases escape, it becomes pretty much a basaltic flow. In summary, basaltic lavas have mild eruptions. Rhyolithic or andesitic lavas have explosive eruption. So example of a type of lava that is low in viscosity would be basaltic. An example of a lava that is high in viscosity will be rhyolithic. So by, by this we know that in rhyolithic lava, the magma is viscous, it is high in silica, it is pressurized by gas. Think about fireworks. And when we light a fireworks, it's pressure there, the gas is, is pressured on an explode. It's the same thing with a volcano, a big multi-sized firework chamber. That's what I call it. In basaltic lavas now, it's a low silica and release of pressure. So it just flows out like running water. Volcanoes are pretty interesting if we apply the mechanics and understand how it works. So the materials extruded from a volcano, we have the lava flow. We under lava, we can have basaltic lava exhibit fluid behavior. So it's runny, like water. And the types of basaltic flows we have, example, is the pahoho lava, which resembles a twisted and ropey texture. We have a picture of that coming up. It's basically like a kind of fluffy looking, like how we would play with slime. It looks exactly like slime, except it's hot and it's wet, and it, it's very much fire-like, right? And as lava, rough, jagged, blocky texture. So lava could be rough, jagged, blocky, meaning they have small stones in them. And then we have the pahoho lava, which resembles slime. So I, this is my example, slime. So I know many of you know what is slime. So when you see the picture of pahoho lava, you will understand what we're talking about. When we talk about now the dissolved gases, it is 1% or 6% by weight, and it mainly consists of H2O, which is water, and CO2, which is carbon dioxide. So H2O is water, and CO2 is carbon dioxide. And as you reach into secondary school, whether what form you're in, you need to understand that H2O is water and CO2 is carbon once you're doing a science subject. Remember, geography is a science, so sometimes you have to apply the little chemistry, you have to understand the physics, and so forth. So this is a pahoho lava flow. It looks like slime to me, right? It's very much, um, very slow, runny. It is runny, but it moves slow. It don't run fast like water. And it, when it cools, it solidifies into layers and it looks like slime. So this is what I mean. The lava that is red and glowing here in the center, these are the ones that are now coming out of the, the volcano. And the ones in the, in the extreme right and left that are black, these are cool. So when it cools, it turns, it solidifies into rock material or new layer of land and it turns to black which will have like ash and dust and all the materials from the magma. This is another, this is a lava flow now. So this is a pahoho lava flow. Pretty much we find it like in the volcanoes in Hawaii. And this is a lava flow now. It's very rocky and crumbly. And as these people walk, it's flowing behind them. It's not moving fast to say it will overtake them. But it is, think about like, a pile of mud just following you slowly. This is what it looks like. But in its path, it will burn everything. It's very dangerous at the same time. So materials extruded or thrown out from a volcano. These are the pyroclastic materials and they we call fire fragments. There are many types of pyroclastic debris. There's ash and dust, fine glassy fragments. There's pumice, which is porous rock from frothy lava. If you go and 
any volcanic island, they have these rocks for sale, right? In my last visit to Montserrat, because I visited Montserrat when I was a student studying geography, we collected many pumice rocks. We saw the lapilli and the walnut sized material and so forth. Then we have cinders, which is pea sized material. It's very small, it's very grainy. Then we have lapilli, which is a bigger size to these cinders. It's walnut size. So think about a walnut and rocks and volcanic material that solidifies in the earth looking like that size. Now, when these, when these material pitches out from the volcano, the pumice, the cinder, and the lapilli, they tend to be red, meaning they are hot. So think about um, the coals in a barbecue grill being, being um, you're like you're ready to barbecue, so it's red, right? This is how it comes out, the volcano. And as it cools, it solidifies, and it comes down, it turns to like a rock material. Particles larger than lapilli can also come out of a lava, such as blocks and bombs. Blocks is hardened or cool lava. So we can reach up to the size of a brick or even bigger. And bombs ejected as hot lava flow. So bombs is another material that is extruded from a volcano. This is an eruption of Kilau Volcano in Hawaii. It was taken at nighttime. So you see how hot the lava, it's fiery lava, just pitching out from the top of the volcano, right? These are interesting fake, fake pictures to look at because it helps describe what we have been doing. This is a volcanic bomb. As you can see, it is cool. It's just about two centimeters in width. It's not that big, but it solidifies into rocks and it looks like this. So volcanoes now have general features and before in our previous lesson we talk about the composite volca volcano and we talk about the crater, the caldera, etc. Right, so general features. Opening at the summit of the volcano, so watch my little sketch here, this is the volcano. Summit is at the top, is the crater. Right, the caldera is the summit depression, so the caldera will be the sink inside the top of the crater, that's the caldera. And sometimes when it is blocked over time, let's say the vent is blocked, water fills up in there and it's for, formed a crater lake. Okay, so the caldera is filled with water forming a crater lake. The caldera summit depression, which is less than one kilometer diameter, produced by a collapse following a massive eruption. So sometimes the top of the crater falls inside, creating a caldera. The vent now is the opening connected to the magma chamber. So the vent is not the whole top. The whole top is the crater, but the vent is the top of the pipe from the magma chamber coming down into the Earth's core. A fumarole emits only gas and smoke, and this will be like a little hole in the volcano, and it will just pitch out gas and smoke. That's fumarole. So it's very interesting, right? So again, the crater is at the top. A caldera is a collapsed crater after volcanic eruption. The vent is the opening to the Earth's crust from the Earth's magma, right? So if we have technology that could probably go inside a volcano from the vent, we will go straight into the magma chamber in the core of the Earth. Then we have fumaroles, which emits only gas and smoke. So sometimes when a volcano erupting right to the side, you will see gas and dust pitching out. These are fumaroles. There are different types of volcanoes, and this is a recap from what we did. There are shale volcanoes, which is broad, slightly dome-shaped, generally cover large areas and produce mild eruption of large basaltic lava. So it's not uh, violent. These are not violent, right? They are not violent volcanoes. They do not explode in a sense that could damage. It just flows lava out in a basaltic manner. Example is the Mauna Loa on Hawaii. And when these type of volcano erupt, we see the pahoho lava flowing out, the slime-like lava that we saw before, we see that. This is the anatomy of a shield volcano. You see, it's very, it's not high. It is a hilly, but it just spans a little above the earth's crust, right? It's just like this, like you, you could drive over it then with a vehicle. This is the summit caldera. This is at the top of the vent is. This is the flank eruption. A flank eruption is when magma just happened to find a passageway from the original vent to another part of the volcano. 
Then we have a shallow magma chamber, right? This is the oceanic crust. That, well, it could be oceanic or continental, depending on where the volcano. Remember, we have underwater volcanoes as well. This is the lithospheric mantle. So this is like the first layer of mantle after the crust. And the vent for that volcano will be even down in the mantle of the earth. Remember in our first types of lesson, we talk about the structure of the earth's surface. We talk about the crust, the mantle, and the core, right? So the volcano chamber, or sorry, not the chamber, the volcano chamber, yes, rest is on the mantle and the asthenosphere. You have the mantle plumes, you have the region of partial melting, so materials are melted in here, and with pressure, it pushes up into the magma chamber, which is like the storage. And from the magma chamber, it flows out of the volcano. In this case, it is a shale volcano, so it's not explosive. This is profiles of volcanic landforms, right? So we have a caldera at the top. So this is, for example, this is Mauna Loa in Hawaii. So we have the sea. This here is the sea. On the other side, we have the sea as well. So it just formed like a little island. This is the caldera here where the vent is, so right here, and it will continuously flow lava out this side, right? The crater is also where the caldera is, and basically it will just be runny lava. So it will start to look like those slime lava, the paho we saw before. Then we have cinder cones, and cinder cones are built from ejected lava, mainly cinder-sized fragments. Steep holes and angles, they are small size and frequently occur in groups. Now, cinder cones are just a byproduct of a volcano, but it has potential to erupt and cinder cones look like what this picture is showing us right here. Okay, the shape just, it's like a very tiny volcano then. This is the anatomy of a cinder cone volcano. We have the pyroclastic material from each eruption being built up here. We have the vent, the crater, and the eruption. They look pretty much like a mini volcano. This is the Paracutin volcano in Mexico, which erupted in a cornfield in 1943, burying the entire town. So this is the top of the church's tower here. This is a tall building, and this is the volcano erupting here. Volcano erupted a good distance away from where this church is, right? So think about all the material falling out. This is after the volcano erupted. After the volcano erupted, all the material end up flowing out, covering buildings and so forth, and burning everything in its path. This, what we see here, is just the ending of this volcano, okay? It is not, um, it is not active at the moment. It just finished erupting, hence it still smokes. So the fact that it's still smoking means pollution is still on our eyes. Remember, these are gas, toxic and noxic gases that are released from the volcanoes. And this enters our atmosphere and adds to the greenhouse effect, right? We have to do a we learn about the greenhouse effect eventually. So things to look forward to. The next type of volcano is the composite cone. And this is the regular volcano structure that we know of. It's also called a stratovolcano. Most are located in the adjacent are located adjacent to the Pacific Ocean. Example, Fujiyama and Mount St. Helens. It's a large and it's classic shaped volcano. As I said, the, the, the regular shaped volcano that we know of. It's thousands of feet high and several miles wide at base. Composite. Oh, sorry, it's composed of interbedded lava and pyroclastics. So remember, we talk about if this is a volcano and the materials come out, it solidifies new layers in the surface and continuous eruption will form and make the cone higher. This is what composite cones are all about. Most violent type of activity, example, Mount Vesuvius in Iceland is very, very much violent. When Mount Vesuvius Vesuvius erupted, it caused a lot of activity in the ice. A lot of ice cracked and opened out. This is the anatomy of a composite volcano, right? It's basic crater, vent, parasitic cone, which is like a little cone that forms to the side of the volcano. The pyroclastic material, you see the layers building up and all these layers is from previous eruption. And these are other areas where lava can flow out from. 
it comes through the parasitic cone as well. And this is the conduit or the pipe of the volcano. This seamounts over hot spots. So all the hot spots. Hot spots is where the plates move. So eventually a volcano form, the plates move and it continue going that way. We will look at the structure of hot spots eventually, but I don't want to get into that right now. Volcanoes of a hotspot have spawned several prominent chain of islands. So volcanoes and hotspots form the Marshall Elise Island chains in near Australia. It formed the Hawaiian Ridge. It formed the Emperor Seamounts, the Hawaiian Seamounts, right? So these volcanoes, after they, they form and the plate shift, right? and the place move them, it move away from the source of the magma. So they solidify and just look like land, a big, huge land mass, and eventually people settle. Now, this is not a day process. This takes hundreds and thousands and millions of years to happen. Okay, we can't, we just, we can't just look at it and see it. But there was this, um, there are instances where offshore islands just emerge from below the sea. And the reason this is because they were always below and because of pressure, they just popped up and form islands, okay? It do happen like that as well. These volcanoes became increasing, these volcanoes become increasing younger, proceeding southerly than southeasterly, right? So this is the direction of the plate moving. It's moving that way, right? And the older volcanoes are up here on the north side, so this is the movement of the plate. The oldest volcano is here and then it comes down. And the younger one is to the very end. So as the plate moves, the older volcano go. Right? The Hawaiian Islands. As the Pacific plates move west-northwest at a rate of about six millimeters per year, magma rises through the thin crust, causing volcanoes, the un- relenting erosion of waves tend to plane off the island unless protected by coral reefs. So the, uh, the Hawaiian islands are known as hotspots and we have some hotspots island as well in the Caribbean and I have a diagram to draw to explain this better for you. But take a look at this picture. Progressive aging hotspot volcanoes. These are the oldest here. And as they grow, the youngest one, the most active one will be the youngest one. So at one point in time, this old volcano would have been here. But the fact that the plate is moving in this direction, it pushes the volcano forward. And because we have magma releasing from the source here, the, a volcano will always form where this is. So in maybe 100,000 years from now, this volcano will move to this spot and a new one will grow. And this is what we call hot spots, right? So as they move, as the volcano moves away from the so deep source of magma or the magma chamber where, they, where it's flowing to the surface, it solidifies and it just forms a regular mountain, like a regular piece of land. Eventually, when the plates continuously move, it forms new land, new land. And this is how we have islands just popping up, okay? And this is what it looks like in real. So this is the, the newest one here. The plate is moving this direction and all these are from previous years. And when I say previous, as I'm talking millions of years ago. And they form islands. So this is how the Hawaiian islands were formed. The most active area is currently the Kilau Rift along the southeastern coast of the island of Hawaii. So this is a, a diagram of that. We have Kilau here and then Mauna Loa. So Mauna Loa and Kilau are active right now. Here, large slumps of block produce tensile scarps, which allow molten lava to flow up to the surface more easily, loading the head of the slumps. Lohi is the next island forming. So after Kilau, Lohi, look it's right here, is the other island that will be formed from volcanic er eruption. And islands will continuously be forming once there's a source of magma pushing up through the crust. It usually starts to form underwater and then it moves. This is a pali escarpment. 
A palace escarpment across Molokai and Au is a gigantic landslide escarpment formed when the northern side of those islands detach itself and slide into the ocean. So a lot of volcanic material and, and activities happen around this time. Now, again, we're talking about it on Terry, but it actually happened hundreds of thousands of years ago. So this is the escarpment here. Just a projected piece of land and it is looking very mountainous in quality, but it is actually made from a volcanic eruption or material coming up to the surface. Now we're looking at the bathymetry of the detachments. Bathymetry surveys off the north coast of Awa and Molokai show an enormous deb debris field. So all here, you see in the debris, this is where it detached and leaving the steady landmass, the high landmass and the mountainous areas. But we see in, this is the, all these mountains, right? Eventually that was part of the volcano and as the plates moved, they detached. Massive sub aqueous landslide debris fields extending around the Hawaiian Islands initially identified by J.G. Moore in the U.S. Geological Survey. Now this is just added information I thought was very interesting, so I just wanted to share it with you. So you see any debris at the side of all, so meaning they were once part of the general landmass here, Hawaii, Maui, Aui, and Kaui, all these, and it was detached at one point due to plate movement. Then we have Cascade Volcanoes, and there are 13 potentially active volcanoes in the Cascade Range of the Northwestern United States. This is where the San Andreas Fault is, and this is located in California. So most of the active volcanoes actually happens in California, the Californian Ridge. So we have Mount Baker, the Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, Mount Hood, Mount Jefferson, the Three Sisters, which is three volcanoes, I think if you Google it, you'll find good stories about this. Newberry Volcano, Crater Lake, Medicine Volcano, Mount Shasta, and Lassen. Mount St. Helens, prior to the 1980 eruption. So the top of Mount St. Helen is basically ice. But when it erupts, it melts, obviously. It goes down. Mount St. Helen after the 1980 eruption. So this is before it erupted. It's so circle. Watch it top. The entire top of the volcano was blown off. Watch it here. It's very high and steep and it got low, right? And basically it wore off the entire top that was once here. So that could only tell you Mount St. Helens is a violent eruption. Precursory stages of Mount St. Helens eruption. So we have A, March 20th, 1980. Intrusion of magma generates the earthquake. So because magma started to build up, they started to feel earthquakes coming from it. That's how they know the volcano was active. In part B now, we have 1980, April 23rd, 1980. They continued, it started to bulge. So because the pressure building up, remember we talked about in our last lecture, when the pressure inside the volcano built up, it started to swell. Think about a pregnant lady. When the baby gets bigger, she swells, and eventually the baby will born. It's the same thing. When pressure and magma builds up inside the volcano, it swells the top, and that's when we know it's ready to burst. After it erupts, it wore off the entire side here, and the whole top was blown off, creating this huge crater like um, this huge crater then forming from it. So let's go back to this picture. This is what it was. This is what it blown off. This entire thing here is the crater and this here is the vent. Cross section of Mount St. Helens showing deep rotational slide blocks which slid off the peak. All right, so the, the whole top of the volcano was blown off. The atmospheric impacts of May 18, 1980 after the Mount St. Helen eruption. So it erupted here, and ash blowed throughout America. Everywhere, every state in America felt ash falls. Mount St. Helen eruption shut 
volcanic ash to an altitude of 60,000 feet into the stratosphere. So from the mouth of the volcano, it material was so explosive that it shoots up to 60,000 feet up in the air. Remember, after the stratosphere is the exonosphere and then space. So I mean, think about how high the impact that made on the Earth's environment. Relative distribution of blown down trees, lahas, debris flows in the Tutul River Valley on the north side of Mount St. Helens. So because of those, that eruption from Mount St. Helens, we had lahas forming and debris and flow which destroyed and blew down trees, right? So it, it impacted the ecosystem greatly. Mount St. Helens blast flattened Douglas tree firs over an area of 400. So all these are fallen trees. Look at that. This is like an entire forest that were just carved down, looking like little matchsticks in this picture. But all those are tree barks. Laha's debris and debris flow and debris choking of rivers caused by Mount St. Helens eruption. So here is the eruption. And this is the way at which the debris flow and it eventually choked the river mouth and this caused huge floods. Volcanoes. We have New Yardente, a deadly pyroclastic flow. So if you ever heard the news that a volcano erupts and they, they refer to it as New Yardente, you know that it's a violent volcano. It's fiery pyroclastic flow made of hot gases infused with ash and other debris, also known as glowing avalanches move down the slopes of a volcano at a speed of up to 200 kilometers per hour. Then we have lajas, which is volcanic mud flow. So when rain fall after a volcano and the ash, ash mixes with the dust and the water, it forms a muddy flow. Mixture of volcanic debris and water move downstream valleys on volcanic slope, often with destructive results. This is a New Year Dente on Mount St. Helens after May 1980 eruption. It was violent. Think about it. What's happening behind all that those dust and gas and bombs going up there? A viscous lava flow passing through the village of Goma in the Congo during the eruption of the Niara Congo in January 2002. So this, this was no, it was violent. And yes, the, the lava flowed slowly and gently, but it did destroy things in this path. The only upside to this flow is the fact that people have time to move, but at the same time, they don't have time to evacuate. Other volcanic landforms. We have the caldera, which we talk about when the crater falls in, it forms the caldera, produced by collapse. And then we have pyroclastic flow, which is felsic and intermediate magma, consists of ash, pumice, and other debris. Materials ejected at high velocities, example, the Yellowstone Plateau. This is the formation of a crater lake in Oregon, right? The eruption of Mount Mansama. This happened, erupted. Then after the volcano erupted, it collapsed and formed a crater, right? So we have it here, partially empty magma chamber. Volcano, it builds up pressure, forms an eruption. After it erupted, it collapsed here. And eventually over time, when materials at the below section here solidifies, it forms crater lake. And it forms a habitat for fishes and so forth, but eventually it could blow off again. Other volcanic landform, uh, extrusive features. We talk about fissure eruption and lava plateaus. So but fluid basaltic lava extruded from crustal fractures called fissures. So if we have cracks on the Earth's surface, basaltic lava, which is the easy flowing runny lava, will flow out of the surface. And when this flows out, it flows out and form a flat piece of land known as a plateau. When we do map work, you'll understand what a plateau is in more details. Then we have lava domes, which is bulbous mass of congealed lava associated with explosive eruption of gas-rich magma. So this is very like boulders, huge boulders of lava that are solidified from domes. A lava dome. So this is a dome here. Underneath is the hot lava, but eventually it solidifies here in a kind of mountain little shape. So that's a dome. And it forms 
at the end of a crater or caldera then. And after the caldera, this is what coaxed the caldera to form the lake, the dome. Other volcanic landforms are volcanic pipes and necks. The pipes are the short conduits that connect to the magma chamber. And the volcanic necks, example, Shiprock, New Mexico, is resistant vents left standing after erosion has removed the volcanic cone. So basically, we have a volcano. It erupts violently and the whole top is eaten away. And then we end up with a big open piece of land. This is called a neck. So here we have a, a formation of a volcanic neck. This is the volcanic neck here. This was initially the entire volcano, but after eruption, it forms the, the caldera. The crater falls in and co collapses, forming a caldera. This is an intrusive feature called a dike. We have to go into that just now. And this is the top part of the remainder where the vent is right now. We call it a neck. The most famous volcanic neck in the United States is the Shiprock in New Mexico. And this is it right here. All right, it's just in the center, but all the area around it was is basically the caldera that is that was collapsed from a huge volcano. Right, so this is the neck here, but the, all these areas around here is not mountains you're seeing. That is the caldera, right? This is like the new vent of the volcano. So if the volcano here after you erupt, it will start back right here. And this whole thing is the mouth of the volcano. Intrusive igneous activity. Most magma is then placed at depth in the earth. Once cool and solidify, it is called plutons. So sometimes before magma reaches the surface of the earth, to call lava, it is inside the, the crust and it, sometimes it's solidified and we call it a pluton. The nature of pluton. The shape is tabular, which is very sheet-like. It looks like this. Versus masses, massive. Orientation with respect to the host of surrounding rock. It could be concordant or discordant. Other intrusive or igneous activity, we have dike is a tabular discordant pluton and sill is a tabular concordant pluton. And then we have laculate, similar to a sill, lens or mushroom shaped mass and arches overly strata upwards. So take a look at this diagram. We have fissure eruption, relationship between volcanism and the intrusive igneous activity. Intrusive igneous activity happens below the Earth's surface, so from here to here. Extrusive, what we've been talking about, the cones, the caldera, etc., happens on top. This is a diabase die cutting through the Precambrian age in Hakatai Shale at Hans Rapid in the Grand Canyon. So this is a dike in the Grand Canyon. A sill in the Salt River Canyon, Arizona. This is a sill. This piece right here. It was a sill, it just reached up to the surface, right? Below the Earth's surface was a sill, it reached up and we can see that clearly identified. We have intrusive features continued. We have batholit and its large intrusive body. Surface exposure 100 plus kilometers squared and smaller bodies are termed stops. Frequently form the cause of mountain. So batholiths are found in the heart of mountains. So this is your mountain chains. The batholiths are found in the core. Remember mountains are, are formed from volcanic material and plate movement. Our next lesson is full mountain and you'll understand why the Northern Range stands, why we have huge mountains such as the Himalayas and so forth. So a sill, I have some basic definition here. A sill is formed when magma flows horizontally between rock layers. So let's say this is a volcano, right? And this is below the, the crust. And this is the strata of the earth. This is the chamber, the magma chamber. A sill is when magma flows horizontally. So a sill is when magma flows horizontally and it's solidified. So if you had to draw a diagram of a sill, we would draw the, the strata of the rocks like this meaning the layers of rocks, and we can just draw it in here. This is a sill, it is horizontal, right? A dike is a vertical sheet 
formed when magma moving towards the surface through the layer. So a dike is vertical, it looks something like this. If I want to do a rough sketch of a sill, this is a sill, this is a dike, and this is the strata of the earth. Strata of the earth, right? So the layers of the earth. And the batalite is a very large feature form an underground reservoir of molten rock cools and hard. So a batalite is like, it's a sill and a dike is small, but the batalite is a lot bigger. So it could be like this. It could be horizontal or vertical, but it's huge. That's how we know the difference, right? So this is a batalite. So remember that, right? So we have a sill, a dike, and a batalite. So let me take you to my whiteboard and I will show you a proper diagram. Let's don't do things half as Let's do it properly. So we have, I will put this, the, the layers of the earth in brown, right? So this is the layer of the earth. We have it looking like this, with different layers, strata. Right, and we'll label in black. So these are the layers of the earth. Okay, maybe the mantle is below the cross. Okay, below the cross. If we draw a sill, a sill is basically that feature running horizontally. So let's draw a sill. A sill is small and it looks something like this. And we can call it in. This is a sill. So let's label it. Let's label it sill. And then we have a dike. A dike is up on or a vertical way like this. So a sill is just a vertical. A uh, dike, sorry, is a vertical sill. Right? And all these are intrusive features. So this is a dike. And a battle it now is the big boulder like thing in the bottom, or bigger than a sill or a dike, and you color it. Right, so this in essence is volcanic features. And I really want you to appreciate these things because we live in the Caribbean, we live amongst plate margins and you need to know how things happen, right? So this is the battle, I'm trying to make it darker. So we just label it now. This is the battle. And all this is termed intrusive volcanic features. So pause the video and take this diagram down in your notes. Right, so let's go back to our lecture now. So we know what is a sill, a dike, and a battle. It's and it's internal or intrusive features of volcanoes. We have a classic igneous battle. So this battle is this big thing in the bottom. The cells run horizontal and the dikes run vertical. Again, diagram of a battle. When battle are uplifted and exposed, they are usually resistant strata that form the roots of mountain ranges or eroded highlands, right? So at the base of mountains, you can find battlets. These are the battlets of Western North America. We have coastal range battlet. We have the California battlet. And this formed the mountain range in the Californian state. So plate tectonics and igneous activity. So global distribution of igneous activity is not random, right? Most volcanoes are located within or near ocean basin. So it's most volcanoes, when we think about volcanoes, it's always found near the ocean. Basaltic rock, which is equals to oceanic and continental setting. So because we, we have runny lava, we call it basaltic flow. 
right? Runny meaning water and high in silica. So it built up of the oceanic and the continental setting. Then we have granite rocks, which is basically of land setting or the continental plates. Continental is landmass. This is just a, a world map of the distribution of the world's major volcanoes, right? You'll see the name, so we'll go through this now. We have, we have the Hawaiian chain, we have Kilau, Mauna Loa. Below Hawaii, you'll find Australia, we have seen the volcanic chain of Ton, the Tonga Islands. We have Tamba, Tambora, Krakatoa. Krakatoa is a, is a underwater volcano that recently emerged. We have Mount Mayan, Hinatabu, Fujiyama. All these are in Japan and the Asian country. Mount St. Helens, you will see here, is in America near California. We have Popocatepetl, which is basically in Mexico, Paracutin and also Mexico. We have the Galapagos Islands, which is formed. We have the Nevado del Ruiz and Misty, which is found in South America near Chile. We have the Canary Islands. We have Mount Pele, which is active in the Caribbean. We have Etna, we have Vesuvius, we have San Torini, we have Lucky, Sertzi. Sertzi is very, very interesting. Sertzi was once underwater and one day, and this is real, a real story I'm telling you here. One day a fisherman was off the coast of Helka by Lucky fishing. He was, uh, uh, he was just fishing, making his daily meal and so forth. And out of the blue, the water started to rise. And eventually, Sertzi popped up. Imagine you fishing in a boat and a huge llama just pops up and you're confused, right? You have, you have no geographical understanding. All you just see this big island. Sertzi is actually a volcano. So plate tectonics and igneous activity continued. Igneous activity at plate margins. We have spreading centers. The greatest volume of volcanic rock is produced along the oceanic ridge system, which is the mechanism for spreading. The decompression of melting of the mantle occurs at, as the lithosphere is pulled apart, and large quantities of basaltic magma are produced. Volatiles driven from the subduction crust, lower melting temperature and so forth. So this here we have a destructive plate margin. We have the subduction zone where the oceanic plate is pushes downwards and it melts, it melts, water evaporates, and then the oceanic crust is pushed up against it. And this is how these mountains are formed when the plates move and pushes. Remember, we will look at full mountains. We'll talk about folding and faulting and how they fold, how the land folds up. Plate tectonics and igneous activity. We need to know about the subduction zone. And this is where we have a destructive plate margin, uh, where there'd be two continentals, two oceanic or oceanic and a continental meet. So subduction zone occur in the conjunction with deep oceanic trenches, partially melting of the descending plates and the upper mantle. So the plate that subducts underneath the heavier plate it will be destroyed. Rising magma can form either an island arc in the ocean or a volcanic arc in, in, in a continental margin. So associated with the Pacific Ocean Basin, we have region around the margin known as the Ring of Fire. A majority of the world's explosive volcanoes are found in the Pacific Ocean Basin, which is subducted. So we'll go back to this diagram. Subduction, the oceanic crust is sunk. The heavier crust is the oceanic crust and it sinks. The less denser crust comes over it. It melts at the subduction zone. And because of that, it pushes magma up, right? And it forms volcano. And by the plate constantly moving, it could shift away and form a chain of volcanoes or a chain of mountains. Or in the ocean, it could form hot spots. Rising mantle plume, rapid decomposition. So we have... A is rising mantle plume. B, rapid decompression, melting produces flood basalt. And C, rising plume tail produced by linear seafloor volcanic chain. 
So plate tectonics and igneous activities continue to talk about intraplate volcanism. Occurs within a tectonic plate is associated with mantle plumes, which is the mantle below the crust, the, the lava, magma below the earth's crust. Localized volcanic region in the overriding plate are called hotspot. It produces basaltic magma and sources in the oceanic crust, such as Hawaii and Iceland. It produces Granitic magma sources in the continental crust, such as the Yellowstone Park. So this is a global distribution of flood basal provinces and associated hotspots in the Earth's crust. Some of these formed in failed continental rifts like Siberia and Kiwi Union Rift in the USA. So all these here are basalt thick flows. You see it black on the map. Volcanoes and climate. The basic premise, explosive eruption emit huge quantities of gas, sulfur dioxide, SO2. So SO2 is sulfur dioxide and fine grain debris. A portion of the incoming solar radiation is reflected and filtered out. Past examples of volcanism affecting climate are Mount Tambora in Indonesia and Krakatoa in Indonesia as well. So these volcanoes emit, erupted and emit so much gas in the air, it changed the whole climate of where they um, originally were. For example, if an uh, active volcano erupts in Iceland or a place that is very cold, or maybe Greenland where you have huge ice caps, this can change the climate. It can lock heat into the earth and by this, the ice will melt. Now, this is a separate topic called the greenhouse effect. As I say, we will go through this eventually. So, more modern examples of volcanoes that affected the climate and the weather will be Mount St. Helen in Washington, El Chichon in Mexico, and Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. The Pinatubo eruption in June 1991, that I'm showing here, the aerial distribution of pyroclastic flow. So here's the mount or the vent of the volcano and all these areas is where materials reach. If you have to put a volcano inside Trinidad, our volcanic material could probably reach in the heart of Guyana and so forth, it, it, it shoots far. So we have sulfur dioxide emission in large volcanic eruption from 1979. Remember, the more sulfur dioxide or gas enters the atmosphere, it causes a change in the weather patterns and so forth. These gases go up into our atmosphere and blocks the, the sunlight. Well, it don't block the sunlight, but it traps heat into the Earth's surface. So we get hotter temperatures. So the impact of sulfur dioxide emission in the global climate caused by the formation of hydrogen, which is water, and sulfur dioxide, aerosol of deflecting radiant energy. So the volcano erupts, big cloud that form here, have sulfur dioxide, ash, and hydrochloric acid. HCI is hydrochloric acid. All these mixes and form condensation and eventually it builds up in the sky. The Earth's albedo, which is the top part where heat comes in, how the sunlight enters, it don't, it don't come down to Earth then. It reflects back out into space. And because of this, we have serous nucleation and the troposphere. And because of this, we have hotter temperatures because it traps heat into Earth. So here we have the volcanic plugs. Remember we talk about some volcanoes, eventually they, they turn non-existent. So they are uh, once were active, they erupted, but then eventually they, they turn passive because of the volcano or the volcanic plug. This cuts away the vent then. So this is the magma chamber and this plug is what a plug does. Think about you, you cork in your bathroom drain from water entering out and coming in. This is what a volcanic plug does. It plugs the volcano 
and eventually the magma below will solidify. And as the plate move, millions of years, the vent that connects the magma chamber to the core of the earth will will be removed and moved and it becomes solidified magma. So changes in to the extrusive and intrusive features over time. Volcanic features change over time. Soon as extrusive volcanic features develop on the surface, forces such as weather and an erosion begin to act upon them. So weathering is when we have extreme temperature and weather patterns. So for example, if we have places that experience winter, let's say rainfall and water settles in the cracks of rocks, and then winter time now, the temperatures are so high, it freezes in the rocks. This water expands inside the rock, causing it to break apart. Weathering now is the physical disintegration of rocks. For instance, some volcanic cones are made up of loose, unconsolidated material, such as ash, Such material is fairly easily eroded. Rivers or streams flowing down the slopes of these volcanic cones may cut deep channels into them. Into the photo, in the photo to your side, you can see La Soufre in St. Vincent. Many channels have been cut into slopes of this by running water, right? So if you look here, the slope of the volcano have channels which for looks like tributaries carrying water away and to the surface of the earth. In some cases, a volcano may be completely worn away, leaving behind a volcanic plug. So all here once was a volcano. And after eruption, it disappears. Let's just be talking about millions of years ago. Eh? Eventually, the size of the volcano wears out, and this is the plug. But below the plug was once the magma chamber. This is the chapel of St. Michael in Barbados, um, not Barbados, sorry, in France. The photo below shows a volcanic plug located in France. So this is a volcanic plug and they built a church on top. Now they could go ahead and inhabit, and inhabit these areas because eventually when the earth, the plates move, the volcano becomes dormant. Here we have intrusive features are often made of very resistant rock. So weathering and erosion may remove the material. So remember we draw a diagram of the sill. This is the sill. So this is a piece of hard rock that weathering can come by easily. But over years, the rocks surrounding it can be worn away, leaving a big piece of land looking like this. Right? So when this happened, these features are exposed to the surface. The photo below shows a sill in Scotland. So now this sill probably was a sill about 100 million years ago. But because of weathering and the, the plate movements and so forth, it comes up to the surface looking like a regular piece of land. But if you test the rocks there, it is very hard material, which shows that it was once volcanic material. So that's how we know it's a sill. And then the general feature of it then shows how it was exposed. So the constant weathering tear away the land and the hard rock, which is the sill here, is now exposed. In a similar manner, a dike may be exposed. So let's say this is our strata layer of the earth and this is the dike. Eventually the land wear away, the dike will not wear away or disintegrate with weathering and so forth because of the material of the rock. It is very hard, right? The photo below show an exposed dike in Australia and this is known as the bread knife. The reason why they call it a bread knife is because it's pointy and looks like the tip of a knife. Battleets may form areas of highland as the materials around them is removed by weather and erosion. An example of this is the Sierra Nevada battlelet in Eastern California. And you see the photo below. This is the battlelet here. It's big. That was once at the core of the earth and eventually, or the core of the mountain then. And remember we said that battlelets are formed in the center of mountains. It's a big feature that was once in the core and it moves up from the mantle into the surface 
in the heart of mountain. So this is the Sierra Nevada mountain range. So this takes me to the end of our lesson. So this lesson was a long one, but we learned a lot, right? Remember to pause the video and make your notes and appreciate these features of volcanoes. Remember, intrusive features are those features from below the Earth's surface, such as sills, dikes, batolites, right? We have lacolites and papolites, but we don't, it's not in the syllabus then. And then we have in extrusive features, such as volcanic cones, caldera, crater lakes, etc. So again, volcanoes are very interesting. I really hope you appreciate my video tutorial today. Um, take as much notes as you can and attempt the questions that I am posted for you. So thank you so much for watching this video tutorial, continuing our lessons in Volcano.